And so that's it for me for, for the insect stuff. If uh, anybody has questions, uh, take me up ahead. Uh, can the time scale be uh, transported all by uh, like firewood or anything like that? Because I know like that's how the ash board typically gets uh, transported. That's what they yeah. try to focus on eliminating uh, tourists yeah. from bringing outside firewood. I think, <coughs> it, it, I mean, it, it's possible. But the thing about red pine scale is that it needs a certain place on the tree where the bark is just thin enough and just right for them where there's enough fluid close to the surface. And so they're all going to be attacking where the branches are half inch in diameter to maybe a quarter to maybe an inch. So somewhere in that range on the branches. So they're never down on the bowl of the tree. And so it would be highly unlikely that anybody would be cutting infested twigs and bringing them with them. Usually, you know, they chop up bigger chunks. And so the likelihood that somebody brought it in firewood is pretty minimal. I mean, you got to remember that even if it was on something you brought up here, it doesn't have legs. It That's right. It can't so, crawl from a piece of wood and go find another tree. Yeah, no wings, no legs. It has to be carried around by something that rubs through that flocculence, picks up those crawlers in their crawling stage when they haven't already settled down, and move them that way. So it's, the chances of that happening are pretty slim. Uh, you said Mass was losing like 5,000 acres of red pine a right. year. How no, much? they're losing 5,000 acres a year. Yeah. How much red pine is in New Hampshire? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not sure of the volume. Uh, I can tell you that this is not in any of the native stands of, of red pine in New Hampshire. The native population is sort of through the, the mid part of the state and north. Most of all the stuff in the southern New Hampshire is all planted. Mm -hmm. um, I think you guys covered the history of the plantations out here. These were all plantations. Um, and so. We're hopeful that the cold temperatures are going to stop it. You know, negative 10 degrees would kill this population. And it just doesn't happen very much down here anymore. Um, but where red pine is native, a little bit higher elevation, um, we're still getting those temperatures on a regular basis. Well, that's one of the reasons we're acting so quickly on this, is we want to kind of try to help prevent spread it, uh, from it spreading further north. So we're, we're treating it pretty aggressively down here and, and harvesting the entire, all, all the plantations in the park. And there's red pine near the campsites that aren't infected. So you would think if it was brought in on firewood, that would sort of be the epicenter spreading out from there. So it, it was unlikely. Is there any other way to treat it besides uh, harvesting? Yeah, there is pesticides. It's not really feasible in a forested situation. Somebody in a landscape situation that has a hedgerow in their backyard <laughs> could treat with a systemic pesticide. Um, so nowadays, the chemical that we use is dinotefiran, and it's applied to the bark, translocates through the bark, runs up into the into the foliage, and anything feeding on the sap of the tree dies. So it's possible; it's just not feasible for it's cost prohibitive, isn't it? Yeah, you could never. And then not only is it cost prohibitive, but there's certain volumes of pesticides you can put per acre. There's labeled limits, and you could never even touch a third of what's out there. So is it expected that all the red pines and the campgrounds and areas like that may well have to be removed in the near future? Yeah. Yeah, by the time I retire, there's not going to be a lot of red pine south of concrete. Yeah. You said they're um, flown feeders? Yeah. So then does that mess up the like nutrient flow oh, yeah. around the tree? And yeah, there's hundreds of thousands of these things. You know, it's, uh, it's a death by, uh, uh, by a slow... Uh, bleeding of the tree. You know, and these things have um, saliva that's toxic that prevents the tree from closing off that wound. Mm -hmm. And so it's like cutting yourself a thousand little minute things and never clotting. And so that's how the tree eventually just basically <coughs> starves to death. And it looked, you know, the classic signs look like the trees in drought stress. And it just and then it dies really quick. There was a question over there somewhere. No, I, I was. Wondering, uh, have you? I know Ashbor is uh, kind of been down more southern parts. Have you? Uh, I don't know if there's too many ash around these parts, but have you noticed any everyone Ashbor taking any effect to any of the uh, population ash in the state? Or Emerald Ashbor that we know of uh, is not in New Hampshire yet. The closest site that we know of is Dalton, Massachusetts. Uh, are you guys familiar with that uh, situation? They, um, they found it in a purple trap. Um, are, you, are you guys familiar with that purple trap system? Um, they finally found it in Dalton, Mass, and they found it in six trees. And they've spent 
you know, a dozen full-time people working on it for the last three months, and they found it with six trees. So that was that's good, and they cut those trees. So we're hopeful. Mm -hmm. Nothing in New Hampshire. We look pretty hard, a variety of different ways. What makes uh, these coniferous trees more susceptible to scale and permadelgia than say deciduous? I don't think they are. Yeah. There's just different types of scales. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of those that fruit and canyon scales on sugar maple was causing huge problems on the west side of the state about five years ago with the uh, sugar bushes. Um, probably more economic damage from that fruit and canyon scale than the red pine scale, just by the virtue of the value of the maple trees. Yeah, why is it attacking like red pine versus white pine? Yeah. yeah. But they're, you know, it's a funny thing about insects. They're very host specific. Where where they're native, they they find a host and they just evolve with it over thousands and thousands of years. You know, and so not only is the insect host specific, but the things that control it are specific. And so that's the problem with invasive insects. They come to this North America and there's nothing to control. None of the um, predatory beetles and flies and all the things that normally parasitize insects in, in New Hampshire will touch this thing. They've never seen it before. They don't even know what to do with it. That's the problem. Some of the literature I read that red pine is the only pine in, in the United States of its of Eurasian descent. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Will we be cutting in the other areas as well that you showed on the map? Um, <coughs> there are like three main areas that were. Exactly. Well, well, you'll see where we're when we, when we leave the park. Uh, this this. Uh, headquarters right here, and we go out. Any red pine plantations you see is what can kind of be harvested. It's all along Deerfield Road and New Rye Road. It's about 120 acres. Uh, it's, most of it's visible from the road. There's a small 11 acre stand on one mile trail that will also be harvesting. We, whoever's working in the park this summer, we can provide you maps with the specific locations of where the harvest is occurred. It all resides in this criteria three zone, though. Sure. Even age management area, mm -hmm. but we do have some pockets of red pine, sort of closer towards the <coughs> ground, that we've been monitoring, and uh, we'll see what happens with those over time. Without the pine scale, when would those trees be harvested? Anyways, just mm -hmm. rotation. Well, Scott just did a thinning in that, that stand about three years ago, yeah. and so we probably wouldn't have entered that stand again for another 15 years, probably. Um, question to do it. How has it been in terms of finding the stands when they are not on public lands? What's the process about you know, contacting the owner of the land and dealing with their interests? Yeah, so we have a variety of different ways that we can find these stands. Sometimes landowners call us. Sometimes we do it from uh, from from the roads, and sometimes we do it from the air. We actually did an aerial survey for red pine scale this fall, and um, and we didn't we didn't pick it up from the air. The problem is, is that the tops of the trees are green and it dies from the bottom up, and so we couldn't pick it up from the air. But we did find through you saw the map, we did find several private properties that were infested just from just from going out from this infestation, um, and those have all been contacted, and they've been given their options on what to do with them, uh, from pesticides to cutting to doing nothing. Um, some and I, there's a little bit of everything going on, um, and they some have chosen to do nothing because it's just ten trees. Some are just going to end up having to cut, have an arborist come in and, and cut hazard trees. Um, a guy in um, up in Loudon is going to have a guy with a portable sawmill come in and cut it all up. So there's there's options out there for them. Yeah. 